Dear colleagues, good morning and welcome to Glasgow. Dear Kolleginnen und Kollegen, einen schönen guten Tag und herzlich willkommen in Glasgow. My name is Joya Falcone and I'm the Ranking Chair of Energy Engineering here at the University of Glasgow. And also a big welcome to those who have joined us online today. So it is my pleasure to be moderating the program for today. And the topic is renewable energies and sustainability. A very relevant topic, of course, given the uh, current uh, landscape of rising energy prices and geopolitical unrest. So you will be hearing today um, from different speakers. Um, you will be hearing views uh, at ministerial levels. You will be hearing regional perspectives. There will be discussions on energy policy, on climate change and sustainability, and also a zoom into hydrogen. We hope really that this forum will uh, lay the foundation of what could potentially become a strategic energy partnership between our regions. I would like to just take one second to uh, personally thank ICAS for having involved me in this uh, adventure today. It has been uh, truly a pleasure to be working with all of you and specifically a big thank you also to Judith for having been so patient with lots and lots of meetings, including odd times when it was probably way after your working hours in Germany. <laughs> thank you. And with regards to the logistics, um, the usual uh, compulsory notification, we don't expect a fire alarm today, but should you hear a sound, please assume it's a real fire alarm and please follow the green arrows that will take you to the uh, escape route down the stairs and out in the parking lot, uh, which is our master point and please wait for further instructions once you're there. And still one little item of logistics, uh, we would like to have a, a group photo before everyone disappears from this initial session. So I've instructed security to lock the doors, no one can leave the photo has been taken. <laughs> and we will uh, take a picture um, prior to the coffee break. So without much further ado, it is my pleasure really to introduce our two opening speeches for today. And first I would like to welcome to the podium, uh, Sir Anton Muscatelli, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Glasgow. And finally, thank you. Well, Joya, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and on behalf of the University of Glasgow to extend a warm welcome uh, to all of you, but particularly to the delegation, both here and remotely uh, from Lower Saxony. And uh, thank you to those uh, uh, who are able to join us today. Uh, can I also extend my welcome to the joint academic directors of, uh, of ACAS, uh, the European Centre for Advanced Studies, Jim Conroy and Jörg uh, Terhechte, and Jörg is, of course, also joining us in his capacity as Vice President of Lofana University uh, of Lüneburg. Um, I'd also like to, uh, to thank, at the outset, uh, Lower Saxony's Minister for the Environment, Christian, Christian Mayer, for his contribution that we're going to shortly be hearing. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we were uh, due to have also Scottish Government Minister Ivan McKee joining us by Zoom, but due to unforeseen circumstances, he's unable to join us. However, he has asked me to uh, note his strong support for today's forum and for Scotland's continued partnership with uh, Lower Saxony. Um, can I also take this opportunity at the outset to thank all our distinguished speakers today who will focus on uh, renewable energies and sustainability. Uh, and thank you, Joya, to you as, as moderator. Uh, Joya Falcone, Professor Joya Falcone is, of course, the university's ranking chair of energy engineering. It's great that you've been able to uh, act as a moderator today, given your expertise, Joya. Uh, I'd also like to put on record my thanks to colleagues from Glasgow and Lower Saxony for organizing today's event and for bringing us together. There are many to name, but I'd like to give my special thanks uh, to Judith Kramer, to Geraldine Brown and colleagues from External Relations. And I've probably left people out, but please, you're, you're all, you're all uh, uh, thanked with, uh, with, uh, with this you've done. You, I know that you know, every time we have a forum, uh, we rely on your expertise to bring us all together. Of course, it's only been uh, one year since the historic Glasgow Climate Pact was uh, agreed in our city. And for us as an institution, I think it's incredibly important that we don't lose the momentum from COP26 to tackle the greatest threat that we face as a planet, which is a climate emergency. And indeed, we've seen just with the conclusion of COP27 and Sharm el-Sheikh just how tenuous 
uh, that uh, that momentum that momentum can't be tenuous but anyway you know what i mean uh, how that momentum is stuttering a bit uh, because we're making some advances on some fronts but not not on others um and i think you know especially as we sit here in glasgow it's a point i made last year during cop 26 but Glasgow benefited hugely as a city from industrialization, but we were also one of the cities that first called uh, and declared for a climate emergency. And so did we at the University of Glasgow. We were the first university in the UK to declare that we would divest of our investments from fossil fuels within a decade. We did that in 2014 and <coughs> reasserted that last year when we reviewed our path towards that. We were also the first institution in Scotland to declare a climate emergency and we published our climate change strategy Glasgow Green, which uh, sets out plans for carbon management and a target of 2030 for carbon neutrality, which is a very challenging target. And during COP26, the uh, underlying, um, underlying themes of the discussion centered around the need to address the climate emergency equitably in an adjusted, fair manner. And this very much remains a priority for us, uh, perhaps even more acutely as we see the geopolitical turmoil that we heard about earlier intensifying on our European borders and the dual cost of living and energy crisis causing immense strain on the households and indeed our societies across the globe. And in tackling these major issues we face, we must place both sustainability and sustainable development at the heart of uh, what we do, all that we do in our thinking, in our policy making, in our decision making. And this is something that we are trying to do here at the University of Glasgow in our own uh, in our own small way, uh, continuing the legacy of COP26. We are striving to engage the entire university community. We are striving to ensure that everyone is enabled to make a difference. In 2020, uh, we launched our Center for Sustainable Solutions, a cross-disciplinary initiative, which draws on our colleagues and students across our campuses and want to drive and support our journey to net zero. And great to see Professor Jamie Tony, who leads the center but also other colleagues involved uh, in the room. And this year, through the centre, we also launched uh, Gallant, which is a, a partnership project with uh, Glasgow City Council, to use our city as a living lab, a test bed for sustainable solutions. Funded with 10 million pounds from the UK's Natural Environment Research Council, uh, colleagues from across the university are taking a whole systems approach to focusing on five key themes linked to the climate emergency like renewable energy and regenerating derelict and polluted land. But we also recognize sustainability requires us to think beyond the traditional uh, scope of climate action. To create the green tra transition the world needs, we, we need to understand the unique role of universities in promoting sustainable and impactful partnership, both at home and globally. And this is why I come to our partnership, such as the one that we've built with Lower Saxony through the the European Centre for Advanced Studies are absolutely very important to us. We launched ACAS in 2019, uh, marking a major milestone in cooperation and research and teaching between Glasgow and Lower Saxony, and it's been extended to other universities uh, across Scotland. And both our universities that began all this in Lufana and Glasgow have embarked on this collective endeavour to pursue our shared interests in the fields of digital, digital culture and media, business informatics, management, law, psychology, and of course, sustainability. And this partnership has led to the creation of the Lower Saxony Scotland Tandem Fellowship Programme, which has allowed our researchers to collaborate in a cross-national exchange at esteemed higher education institutions across Scotland, as I say, not just Glasgow, and across Lower Saxony. And through ACAS, we've also been able to continue to develop the links bilaterally between our two institutions through the Erasmus Mundus joint master's degree in international law of global security, peace and development, as well as the international economic law LLM program, a two-year postgraduate dual degree taught by our school of law here and our counterparts in Lufana. So my colleagues here in Glasgow have heard me speak many times of the serious consequences of Brexit. I'm not going to repeat them today, although it's great that Brexit is back in the news. Actually. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always good to reflect on your errors and your mistakes. So, so it's anyway, I mean, so that's a sort of a side swipe. Apologies for that. Um, what I really want to stress uh, and something I stressed back in 2016 uh, is that we are a proudly European institution, the University of Glasgow. We were a founding member of the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities, which brings together universities across Europe, some in non-EU countries like the UK, Switzerland, and Norway as well. 
We're also part of the Civis Alliance of uh, European Civic Universities, part of the European University um, Initiative, which was started by, uh, kicked off by President Macron. And we count thousands of European staff and students as members of our community. And we are deepening these bilateral partnerships even within the Guild and, and Civis. We know too that our friends and partners in Lower Saxony are proud to share this European identity and more than ever, it's clear from the war on Ukraine that we work towards our shared European values and how important that is. And that's about achieving sustainable and fair development. It's about combating social exclusion. It's about promoting opportunities for all and advancing scientific and technological process, uh, progress. And I'm really pleased to say that particularly with Germany, we have long-standing links, of course, with Lofana, but with other institutions. And it's fantastic that despite Brexit, we welcome over 350 students from Germany to our university every year, and they join a community of 35, over 35,000 students from 140 countries. So looking to the future, we really do hope in Glasgow that we can build on these foundations that we already have with Lower Saxony. I really hope that you all enjoy today's event. I hope that it will lead to discussing some really important challenges facing all our nations and how we foster renewable energy and support a really sustainable transition. And we learned lessons of the last decades uh, that have come back to roost really with uh, the war in Ukraine and the impact it's had on our energy transition. So um, again, thank you all. And can I now hand back over to you, Joya, for the rest of the event. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Anton. And may I now invite to the podium um, Jörg Philipp Direkte for our second opening speech. And in the meantime, I can say Jörg is the academic director of ACUS as well as vice president at Louisiana University of the Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be back here in Glasgow for our conference, the Joint Forum, the third um, Joint Forum. And it's the first one, uh, which is uh, not only online, but it's very interesting. And uh, as you know, it's a hybrid conference. So many colleagues are joining us from the internet uh, and uh, we are a smaller group here. And I think uh, I should first of all mention that uh, Laos Saxony, but also my university uh, uh, support the topic of the joint forum today very much, as you know, the situation in Germany changed in the last month in a very dramatic way. So energy policy questions of sustainable energy are on the top of all priority lists in politics. And um, we had a visit in March here in, in Edinburgh together with Stefan Weil, the prime minister of Laos Saxony uh, and some ministers talking about partnerships. And it's not only about politics, it's also about academics, I would say. And that is the core idea of ECAS to bring together um, academics from Laos, Saxony and Scotland to work together on very important issues. And of course, energy policy is an important issue for us at the moment. So I'm very glad to welcome so distinguished colleagues here discussing all the relevant topics today. Um, after we, uh, after, before that, we will uh, hear the um, speech of our minister, our new minister, uh, Christian Mayer. It is a little bit a pity that we had election, elections a couple of weeks ago in our Saxony because the government changed and uh, we had a plan to bring in Olaf Lies, the former minister, and uh, we had a lot of support from uh, the government. We still have the support of the government. If you read the new uh, political papers and coalition agreements, uh, uh, green energy is the top priority for a country in the next uh, years, I would say. And therefore, it, it would be very interesting to pool colleagues from Laos, uh, Saxony and Scotland, of course, and to work together on that issue. So the vision of the prime minister was, and the vision of many academics would be to work together with uh, yeah, partners we really know, which whom we share the same values. This is very important at the moment and, and very hot debate in Germany. And therefore we can build on the structures we already have in place. So ICAS as uh, 
the principal or already said, is uh, a very long, not, not very long, but a long standing tradition between the University of Glasgow and Northana University. We uh, run together a couple of programs now, uh, academic cooperation, secondments and so on. And we have this uh, fantastic fellowship program for young researchers. So we had a conference in Sterling a couple of weeks ago. And I think it's very important to work together with partners you really know, and you really can build on trust. And that is what ECAS is exactly about. And I'm very grateful. Um, I think uh, it's not only about the discussions we have today. If you have a look to the program, we have also uh, sessions tomorrow, online sessions on all, on very, on, on, on different academic topics, bringing together universities uh, from Scotland and now Saxony. And I'm very proud to say that it's today, it's a very good, a strong network of 40 universities here in Scotland and Saxony, and we want to expand it. We had a, a visit with Georg Schütter, the um, chairman of the uh, Volkswagen Foundation, the biggest private science foundation of Europe, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the uh, president of the Lao Saxonian Rectors Conference, Susanne Menzel. And I'm glad that I can I can't confirm, but I can say that there's a strong tendency that the next funding lines. Uh, of the Volkswagen Foundation, we especially focus on Scottish Lao Saxonian partnerships. And that is something we want to start here to, today. And it would be one idea, we already talked about that, that we um, maybe we establish a kind of Lao Saxonian or Scottish Lao Saxonian network on uh, sustainable energy or something like that. So it's really up to you. I have to say, to confess, I'm just a lawyer. I sometimes work in energy law, but it would be fantastic. And you are really the, the perfect person to do this because uh, she lived in Klaustal Zellerfeld in Lower Saxony for five years. <clears throat> the only It's up in the mountains, a very good but small university. Um, and um, in, in the Hartz Mountains, may you know, may you may not. Uh, but it must have been a fantastic uh, experience to, to work and live in a university town, which has, as we say in Germany, two winter terms, because <laughs> well, it's always very cold in Klaustal. So it's pretty interesting. I'm very grateful uh, for all your support that you do this here. And uh, it would be wonderful, not only from an academic perspective, but also from a political perspective, if we could really work on such a network, because... Uh, uh, we had yesterday uh, dramatic discussions in Germany about uh, energy blackouts in the winter and so on things. So we are on the very top of the discussion here. So thank you very much. Thanks to the team of ECAS. It's always a pleasure to work together with this fantastic team with this Glasgow Lafana cooperation. I'm very keen to learn more about the top priorities of our minister. So thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Thank you so much for your contribution and also for your kind words. And now we have a video um, pre-recorded by Christian Meyer. The video should be about 10 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, it's ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are even a key format of the Lower Saxony Scotland Joint Forum. Wir leben ja eigentlich vom direkten Austausch und Dialog, deshalb ist es schade, dass ich nicht vor Ort dabei sein kann. Ich möchte aber die Möglichkeit nutzen, mich hier aus Hannover zumindest digital zu beteiligen. Ich bin der neue Minister für Energie, Klimaschutz und Umwelt des Landes Niedersachsen, gerade erst eine Woche im Amt. Aber ich freue mich sehr auf dieses tolle Projekt der gemeinsamen Partnerschaft zwischen Niedersachsen und Schottland. Ich grüße daher alle Teilnehmenden recht herzlich. Dieses Jahr legt das Forum seinen Themenschwerpunkt auf eine mögliche Energiepartnerschaft zwischen Schottland und Niedersachsen. Das ist ein sehr, sehr wichtiger Impuls, der hier kommt, denn wir haben gerade die Energiekrise ausgelöst durch den russischen Angriffskrieg auf die Ukraine. Und wir wollen uns in Niedersachsen so schnell wie möglich unabhängig machen von fossilen Importen und umsteigen auf erneuerbare Energien, auf Klimaschutz und wollen dazu gerade die Partnerschaft mit Schottland nutzen, um gemeinsam es zu erreichen, das Klima zu schützen, Arbeitsplätze zu schaffen und die Energiewende mit Solarenergie, Windenergie, grünen Gasen und grünem Wasserstoff gemeinsam voranzutreiben. Unser Ministerpräsident Stefan Weil war im April dieses Jahres in Edinburgh, um sich vor Ort die Zusammenarbeit mit Schottland im Bereich der erneuerbaren Energien, gerade bei der Offshore-Windenergie, anzutauschen. Und er war sehr begeistert über das, was dort läuft. Und wir würden uns über eine strategische Energiepartnerschaft mit Schottland sehr freuen. Denn es gibt ein enormes Erzeugungspotenzial und große Export- und Importpotenziale bei grünem Wasserstoff. 
Wir bauen gerade in Niedersachsen eine eigene grüne Wasserstoffinfrastruktur auf, wo wir Importe über Wilhelmshaven und Stade, also von der Nordsee, auch nutzen wollen. Und da freuen wir uns auch über gemeinsame Partnerschaften in beide Richtungen, um erneuerbare Energien und grünen Wasserstoff ähm, zu verbringen, um Klimaschutz zu machen. Wir machen in Niedersachsen eine Energiewende Turbo. Wir wollen auf der See deutlich schneller werden bei der Offshore-Windindustrie. Wir wollen an Land die Potenziale nutzen und Niedersachsen zum Energiewendeland, zum führenden Land der erneuerbaren Energien machen. Jetzt ist es schon so, dass Niedersachsen die meisten über 6000 Windenergieanlagen in Deutschland hat und es sollen deutlich mehr werden, damit wir Öl und Gas in Deutschland beenden können. Deshalb machen wir einen Import-Hub, insbesondere für grünen Wasserstoff. Und Schottland ist da ein großes Potenzial dazu für diese Partnerschaft. Und ich bin sehr froh, mit was für einem Tempo es in Schottland und in Niedersachsen gelingt, die Energiewende zu machen. Und es tagte, tagt zu dem Zeitpunkt, wo ich spreche, noch die Weltklimakonferenz und in Ägypten. Und es ist, glaube ich, unser gemeinsamer Anspruch, auch zu zeigen, dass wir die Klimaziele ernst nehmen und uns schützen, denn am Ende ist Klimaschutz, Energiewende auch der Schutz der Menschen und unserer Lebensgrundlagen. Und daher danke ich für Ihren Einsatz und ähm, freue mich, dass wir im Austausch bleiben für solche Formate zwischen Energie, Wirtschaft, Wissenschaft und Politik und äh, freue mich auch auf das geplante Scotland Lower Saxony Hydrogenkonferenz im Februar 2023 und wünsche Ihnen jetzt viel, viel Erfolg, viele nährbare Ideen, um eine sonnige, eine windige Zukunft für Europa zu finden und einen erfolgreichen Verlauf Ihrer Veranstaltung. Dankeschön. Okay, I think we are ready to restart and I hope that everyone online can still hear us and see us. Um, so what, what is coming now is a keynote and panel uh, discussion. And uh, I've got the panel already here. Thank you very much for joining me in this, uh, in this corner of the room. And I think the best thing to do is for me to introduce all our panelists first, and then we can talk a little bit about the logistics of this session, and then we can get started with the various contributions. So I'm joined in this panel, I'm on my very messy paperwork, uh, by uh, panelists in person, but also panelists online. So I have online Knut Kappenberg, Research Service, Energy Research Center for Lower Saxony. Knut, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me, Joya? And I have here in person, Stephen Mark Williams, Executive Director of Energy Technology Partnership Scotland. Bonjour. I have online Karen Turner, Director of the Center for Energy Policy, University of Stratlight. I can see yes. Karen. Hi, Karen. Yes, I'm here. And I also have, again in person, Thomas Schömerus, Professor of Public Law uh, at uh, Leuphane University of Lüneburg. Thank you, Thomas, for joining us. And also in person, I have Jamie Tony, um, Director of the Center for Sustainable Solutions and also Professor of Environmental and Climate Science here at the University of Glasgow. And um, I have Markus Exenberg online, Executive Director of H2 Global Foundation, Uh, David Flynn here with me next to me, professor in cyber-physical systems at the University of Glasgow. And finally, still online, uh, David uh, Scrimger, Scrimger uh, hydrogen advisory and initiator of Scott Tudor study. Welcome to all the panel here and online. And with regards to the logistics, um, what we would like to do is that we're going to have the first three speakers give just a five minutes set of ideas for, for topical matters in energy transition and also potential for collaborations. Um, we will then have a little break for the panel to have some discussions on what has been presented. We will then carry on with two more contributions, another little break for discussions, <laughs> four final contributions on hydrogen. And at that point, we will also open up the floor for questions to the panel. So unless I've forgotten anything else about logistics, I think there was one more slide we wanted to uh, present, but I probably covered it already. So I think I can get started and invite to begin with uh, Knut um, Kappenberg to give us a regional perspective, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Joya. Um, hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> Everybody there at the Zoom cameras and also here at the panel table. I'm not sure if my video is on. I cannot see myself here. Um, 
but but if not it doesn't matter at all the only thing is that i cannot share my my screen from from here thanks be to god we have made one ace up the sleeve and we have um we have sent or i've sent in the slide that i wanted to to show today and probably um the guys from the from the technique can can unlock that that slide it's always the same if you do the kind of last final um uh test everything works perfectly and uh, and then comes real life Anyway, I can I can start already. Um, what I would like to show today is, um, or to make it more tangible, that is the Energy Research Center of Lower Saxony, um, with a short name EFZN. We are a joint scientific center of the Technical University of Braunschweig, the already mentioned Technical University of, of Cluster, where you've spent five years, I've learned today, Joya and the universities of Göttingen, Hanover and Oldenburg. Oh, fantastic. There is there's the slide. Thank you very much. We are a central um, research networking and communication platform. And our job, our mission is to bundle the energy research competences from natural and from engineering sciences but also from legal sciences, social and economic sciences. So the message here is that we have a very high degree of interdisciplinarity, and that is probably also something we will um, talk about later today um, uh, in our discussion. Furthermore, the EFZN brings together the stakeholders in the transformation of the energy system from different fields, science, business, politics and civil society. So the message here is we are not yet there, but we are on the way to transdisciplinarity. The EFZN closely cooperates um, with a high number of further university partners in Lower Saxony. A good example is, is the ECAS, um, which, you know, with which I would like to begin, as we can see here today but also other um, entities like Forwind, which is a joint center for wind energy research, together with the German Aerospace Center, DLR, and the Fraunhofer Institute for Wind Energy System. They form the National Research Alliance on Wind Energy. With other partners, um, for example, the Automotive Research Center, Lower Saxony, the NFF, or the Battery Lab Factory, um, whose research spectrum covers the entire value chain from material development, electrode, cell manufacturing, to battery recycling. I have um, more examples, for example, the German Center for High Performance Drilling and Automation, the Drilling Simulator Seller, um, which aims to simulate the highly complex drilling process by utilizing coupled hardware and software simulators and also includes simulation of actually planned drilling projects. The research results that are obtained by the DSC, the drilling simulated seller, will be used in the conception, in the planning and the realization of future geothermal and underground storage projects in Germany, but also abroad. And if we could um, slide down a little bit on this, on this slide, I would like to um, tackle the non-university research partners. There, for example, we have the Institute of Networked Energy Systems of the German Aerospace Center, the DLRVE, and several institutes of the Fraunhofer uh, Gesellschaft Society in Lower Saxony. Further partners we have are, for example, OFFICE, the Institute for Information Technology in Oldenburg, or the Sociological Research Center SOFI in Göttingen, and just to name a few examples. We have a very lean organization with four service units, and they are all located in the EFZN headquarters. On the one hand, there is the research service, um, of which I'm um, 
proud to be the head of. We have several research lines, six in number, one on wind, on solar, on power to X, integrated energy systems, material and social sciences and humanities. Secondly, as another service unit, we have the contact point science to industry, politics and civil society. We have the public relations, press work and marketing as another service unit and event management, for example, um, right now, tomorrow and uh, on Wednesday, we will have the Lower Saxony Energy Days, where uh, actually Christian Meyer, who just gave, gave the keynote, our new Minister for An Environment, Energy and Climate Protection, will also hold, uh, hold the inauguration speech. One final remark, and just to keep my message simple on what is the EFZN, the EFZN is a one-stop shop for energy research in Lower Saxony, in Germany and in Europe. And from here, um, I'm more than happy to discuss any kind of cooperation, both with the Scottish research institution, institutions as well as the companies in Scotland and in Lower Saxony to strengthen our ties through developing joint projects and activities to build up, which was already mentioned, a strategic partnership that is beneficial for all sides. So thank you very much indeed, Lausanne University. Thank you very much, ICAS and University of Glasgow for having given me the opportunity to speak to you all here today. Thank you. I have uh, fond I have, uh, memories of nice meetings in Goslar. So whenever we wanted to escape the cold of the mountains, we were going down to Goslar, beautiful city, incidentally, with beautiful, beautiful buildings. Um, and I'm now going to um, pass the floor to Stephen Mark Williams. And uh, the two of you will probably now understand why you've been set up for a blind date. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there are many commonalities I between the F10 and EPP. Stephen Mark. Thank you, Scylla. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for that, Knut. Maybe we need to meet uh, some point because, um, in fact, you just uh, basically said what I was going to say, except you just replace uh, EFZN for ETP and pretty much it's exactly what ETP does. Um, so I'm the executive director of ETP. Um, we represent 14 universities across Scotland, um, all of whom have um, a research capability in energy of some kind. Um, originally, though, we were a technology orientated, but we also have kind of branched out into the, the social and natural sciences, um, including kind of the legal um, energy, people, policy and society. Uh, <clears throat> so because we understand, of course, that the issues that we have uh, are in fact probably not technology based at all, uh, but are to do with the citizen uh, and society. Um, so given all of that, um, there are a few other extra things, I suppose, comments that I have to make about uh, the issues I see over the next 15 to 20 years. First of all, what's happened over the last 10 years has been quite interesting, I think, uh, from a UK government point of view, uh, in as much as that the funding for research has definitely become more collaborative on the one hand, and also you have to demonstrate far more um, societal impact on the other. Uh, and I think these two strands are certainly dominating um, funding going forward. Um, a second thing I should say about, I know that we're particularly interested in hydrogen at this meeting uh, today, <clears throat> and it also applies actually to heat, is that because hydrogen has all recently become a thing, um, if you look at even um, strategies, right? the Scottish government strategy from 2017 barely mentions hydrogen, for example. Um, and hydrogen, the research within universities is driven by the funding that comes from UK government and others. The, fu the funding up till three or four years ago wasn't really there for hydrogen. And I think that means that actually we are um, underdeveloped, I would say, as far as um, hydrogen research is concerned uh, within Scotland and the UK to face the demands that we now have on it or are thinking about putting on it um, from the, certainly from the government side. Um, so that's one point I would make. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the last 10, eight years has been very chaotic. Um, I think that was the word that was used um, by one of the presenters and uncertain. Um, in Scotland, it has been particularly so because as well as Brexit, the pandemic, the monarchy and Russia, in 2014, we also had a referendum. Now, we all thought that irrespective of what the what the what the result was going to be that it would go away 
and it hasn't. It's still here. Uh, and that is still a bit of an issue uh, for us, I think, uh, going forward. So it's been very, very chaotic and very uncertain about what's going to happen uh, over the next few years. Um, the two other things I would say is um, the Offshore Wind Industry Council, in response to the uh, recent Scott Wind round, said that um, 70,000 jobs were going to be created by 2026. Well, first of all, um, it has been reported, and unfortunately, I didn't actually get the reference, that uh, by 2020, only 1,500 jobs had been created in offshore wind out of the something like 26,000 that were supposed to have been created. So the first thing is, do they really mean 70,000? If so, how do we actually make sure that we keep those jobs? Um, but the second thing is, OK, assuming that there are 70,000, where are they going to come from? Because this isn't a question of skills, it's a question of people. The people simply aren't there to deliver the plans that we might have. And this isn't just a question of energy, it's a question through society as a whole. What are we going to do when we haven't got the people to do what it is that we want them to do? Um, and finally, uh, also a comment about local authorities. Um, local authorities are in many ways expected to deliver the plans from, for the governments, but they are hopelessly under-resourced to do what it is that they are supposed to be doing. Um, they don't have, uh, and it's not, not their fault, they don't have the competency uh, to absorb either any funding that you give them or any expertise that you give them. So how on earth are we supposed to deliver the transition if a major part of that transition is are the local authorities and they cannot deliver on that? And I think that's, that's a, an important question that we need to discuss amongst ourselves. Um, but finally, personally, um, I, I was very disappointed that we left the that we left the EU. Uh, I'm very happy that Scotland has, has got this um, engage, ongoing engagement with Lower Saxony. Uh, my son is French. I spent seven years um, living and working in France for a German company based in Munich. Uh, my mother is Spanish. Uh, my grandparents were Irish. Um, so, uh, and you can tell I've lived in Scotland for 21 years, you can tell by the accent. Um, so I'm very happy anyway that, uh, to be part of this and thank you very much for uh, asking me along. Thank you very much, Evan Mark. Thank you also for starting to bring us into discussions about the practicalities of the energy transition. And uh, I think this uh, leads me to Tara next. Um, if you can maybe discuss with us something about your views on energy policies. Uh, yes, of course. So um, I, I had a slide as well. Um, I, I don't know whether that will come up. But well, good afternoon, everyone. As, as I've been introduced, I'm Professor Karen Turner. I'm the director of the University of Strathclyde's Interdisciplinary and Policy Facing Centre for Energy Policy based within the School of Government and Public Policy and our Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, but with extensive interdisciplinary cross-faculty industry and policy collaboration. And I should say I am the theme lead on one of uh, the ETP themes that uh, Stephen Mark was talking about. So it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon, and I very much welcome this collaborative initiative being launched today between Scotland and Lower Saxony. Um, I'd like to make three points that I hope will help inform today's discussions. The first is that delivering feasible and sustainable energy policy is increasingly a societal and public policy challenge as much as it is a technical one. And this is particularly given the scale and the nature of the transition required to deliver on net zero objectives and the importance of energy and its cost and how we live and do business. And this becomes clear if we consider my second point, which is that the challenge of balancing affordability energy security and decarbonisation has really been turbocharged by the energy and wider cost of living crisis that are playing out now and how these are impacting political decision making. In the UK and Scotland, it's certainly becoming clear now that if we'd acted on things like improving residential energy efficiency and securing low carbon domestic energy supplies at a greater scale and linked to storage solutions that help us balance our needs with supply, we'd be less vulnerable to global price volatility. Moreover, it's increasingly clear that what needs to be done for net zero may indeed be consistent with ensuring energy security and affordability going forward. But I think even if we've got political, public and business community agreement and the need for such solutions, delivery is not easy. And there's always crucially a crucially important question of who ultimately pays, how and when. 
and how to use gains, which might not accrue to the same parties who are doing the paying at any, diff at any point in time, to balance the outcomes of chosen pathways and required policy actions in a way that is politically, economically uh, and socially feasible. And this isn't this is not least given growing energy poverty rates, certainly in Scotland and the wider UK, and the challenges for businesses and ensuring their businesses are competitive. And I think here it's important to be clear that enabling the transition to net zero is going to require significant new energy system investment, and the cost of delivery will be impacted by the competition for resources in the constrained economic environments of most regions and countries. For example, where we've got limited pools of skilled labourers, as is the case in the UK right now, and underdeveloped domestic supply chains in our, in our energy system and beyond, then not all Zet Net Zero projects can deliver on time in the most cost effective way and deliver the range of direct and indirect economic benefits that are often cited for green economy developments, such as what Stephen Mark was saying about jobs and renewables. I think once the cost picture unfolds, then we've got the question of who meets the cost of securing low carbon, flexible energy supplies, when and how. And in the UK, we have seen government shifting some green levies from consumer energy bills and putting them into general taxation. Now, this is undoubtedly more progressive, but it still has distributional implications that affect the political feasibility of solutions. You know, for example, Lately, there's been a lot of debate over whether energy suppliers who are benefiting from currently high prices should pay a greater share and limit the burden falling on public budgets and taxpayers. But on the other hand, we need to be careful not to depress or displace investment, which will ultimately impact people through employment and other sources of income that are generated in the economy. I think it's also clear that significant market reforms are going to be needed, not just to enable low carbon solutions to integrate into the system, but to ensure that energy markets deliver competitive and affordable outcomes for users. For example, in the UK and other European nations, we've got a real challenge in that the retail price of low carbon electricity is largely driven by the cost faced by gas generators who are called upon to balance supply and demand at any point in time. Here, with gas prices being so high, this might disincentivize decarbonization options that rely on electrification, such as shifting away from gas powered heating systems in, in a country like Scotland. And crucially, it weakens the argument made to publics about supporting low cost renewables if in fact they're not low cost to the households and businesses that pay for them. And these are all the types of issues that we research at the Centre for Energy Policy. And I think organisations like universities have got important roles to play in helping governments understand the implications of different policy options and how they might be affected. And that leads me to the third and final point that I'd like to make today, which I think is particularly relevant to the initiative being launched today. This is that collaboration at different levels and including between countries and regions can be a really key tool for delivering economically efficient and sustainable energy policy options to enable the transition to net zero. And this is both in terms of delivering actual system benefits, for example, in reducing costs via interconnection across different vectors such as electricity and hydrogen, but also in sharing learnings on the nature of and the solutions to the range of challenges in what are increasingly very complex political and societal contexts. And I hope that's something that we can discuss further today. Uh, but thank you. We, we're already entering the discussions on the legal framework and sustainability aspects. I am tempted to actually continue with the contributions by Thomas and Jamie before we take a little break for discussions because it's all coming together quite nicely and believe it or not, there was no preparation. So mm -hmm. it's just uh, obviously the topic is naturally lending itself to uh, the, the right direction. So Thomas, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, my, my very short speech is about the climate change, sustainability, and the role, or you could also say the rule of law. Yeah, maybe we can see the files in one, just one slide in a minute. Yeah, more than 10 years ago, Klaus Bosselmann, a sustainability lawyer from Auckland in New Zealand, wrote an article, Losing the Forest for the Trees. Sustainability law goes beyond the traditional environmental and energy law. We have served, we have saved some trees. So nature protection law and or the water is much cleaner now. But we have lost or we are about 
uh, to lose the global issues, such as climate change and biodiversity uh, losses. So sustainability law is inter and intra-sectional. It is ubiquitous and cross-sectional. And it needs much stricter and stronger regulation, including also further infringement of fundamental rights. So to guarantee the freedom rights for our future generations. This is more or less what our German Supreme Court said in the landmark, in the landmark decision of last year. So looking at environmental and energy law, we can observe new developments due to the Ukrainian war. Now, climate change and the risks of nuclear energy are not the only drivers for enhancing renewables and energy efficiency anymore. The challenges we are facing now are enormous. So environmental and energy law must tackle these challenges at all times. And there are plenty of trade-offs, acceleration of procedures <clears throat> and which lead to intrusions to the rights of access to courts and questions arise whether we should extend the operation time of nuclear power plants, whether it was right to start phasing out nuclear and then now we are phasing out coal, et cetera. So our role as universities is to formulate science-based answers, to be innovative, sometimes provocative, but always objective, neutral, and independent. So our research is the backbone of a sustainable future. This also applies to legal research, and it applies to the research within our ECAS scheme. I'm happy to collaborate with all of you in this future work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas, also for touching upon uh, climate litigation cases. And I think we will probably see more and more in the future. I'm aware there's an, an international database and uh, database is showing an increase in cases. Thank you. Jimmy, I think this is uh, for you now. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think there's a slide for this one as well. Um, yeah, just to start out by saying we launched um, the Center for Sustainable Solutions here at the University of Glasgow in April 2020. And the vision for the center is to enable individuals, organizations, and communities to act towards a sustainable future. And the, when we think about that from a higher education institute standpoint, the ways in which we do that are through education, research, and partnership. And I just wanna say a small piece on the education, first of all, is the current climate that we're in, we're seeing big changes in education. We're seeing people live longer. We're seeing people change career pathways partway through um, their current careers. And so one of the big fo fo focuses that we have um, within the Center for Sustainable Solution is looking at what different market opportunities are arising, such as around decarbonization that we're talking about today, trying to understand what the new skills are um, that the communities need trying to look at how we upskill local communities to be able to take some of those, those jobs that are coming up. So that's, that's one aspect of what we do within the center. But what I wanted to focus on today is um, the partnerships that we've been building. So since uh, 2020, we've been running a series of green recovery dialogues. Um, and these are in partnership with Glasgow City Council and Glasgow City Region. We've learned a huge amount um, by holding, by bringing researchers, practitioners, and policymakers together to really understand the richness of the challenges that the city region faces. And so um, the slide that I have here is a research program that we were awarded this year called Gallant, which is to use Glasgow as a living lab. And we're working with over 28 public and private sector partners We've brought together over 36 researchers across the university who come from all different disciplines, drawing on all of our colleges. Um, so it's funded by the Natural Environmental Research Council. 
but it brings together people from public health, from system science, um, a, a lot of different areas that we're bringing together. And what we're trying to do is look at the city as a system. And in doing that, look at, we have five different areas where we're doing work. We're doing work around flood resili resilience along the Clyde. We're um, looking at how we connect up green spaces across the city to enhance biodiversity. We're looking at how we regenerate vacant and derelict land um, from an engineering perspective so that we're actually sequestering carbon dioxide as we do it. We're looking at what are the social and infrastructural barriers to in, um, active travel throughout the city. And we're also working on community scale clean energy projects throughout the city. And when I say we're taking a systems approach is we're really looking at um, how do we collaborate with our local communities? Um, a lot of what's come out of the green recovery dialogues is recognition, regardless of what topic we're talking about, that a sustainable transition also needs to be a just transition. Um, it came out really um, obviously that the communities um, hold such an important value within the city. So how do we help them make their spaces into places? So a lot of this is around placemaking. And then there's also, um, as has come across in some of the other conversations as well, is there's a real need to align policy at different levels um, and make sure that us from the, re the research base are providing the data and the evidence to make sure that decision-making is, is happening in an evidence-based sort of way. So um, I wanted to highlight the project Gallant that we're doing here. It is place-based, it is work that we're doing in Glasgow City region, but we are um, collaborating internationally in the types of um, methods that we're using, both in terms of how we're interacting with communities, how we're interacting with policymakers, and just to say the, the basis for the system within Gallant and viewing the city as a system is donut economics, which means that whenever you have um, a decision that you're taking forward, or whenever you're, uh, you have uh, economic development, you're actually doing that with the consideration of both the social impacts locally and globally, as well as the ecological impacts locally and globally. So um, we have a huge interdisciplinary team. They're all based here at the University of Glasgow, and we're quite keen to collaborate and look at how, in, in this particular project, the scaling up, I think, is actually sharing lessons um, with other places that are trying to make these changes at the same time. So we're really keen to be involved in those conversations and learn from each other. Thank you, Jim. So with these uh, initial speakers, we've already heard about what academic partnerships can do. We have heard of the challenges in energy policies, taking into account also potential unintended consequences. And we've heard about the sustainability of an energy transition and ensuring it is a just transition. We've also started to talk about different scales, the local global um, reconciliation of scales, what a place really means in the context of an energy transition. And I think it is very appropriate to, to discuss that because we are here as different regions um, in, in Europe. And how do we reconciliate the small scale of one individual project intervention to the broader scale of possibly also imports and exports of products and services, and perhaps also the supply chain, or possibly also the people. So I think it's it's a good time to take a little break for some discussions amongst the uh, panelists. Um, I know it's many of us, I will be keeping very quiet. I'm sure you've got many questions and ideas already. And, um, so any, any of you um, panelists who would like to comment on anything that's been discussed already, add to it, please feel free. So I'll, I'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've been well behaved sitting here quietly to very interesting talks there. I, I think what was really interesting in that discussion was obviously everyone admits we're looking at something complex that needs serious commitment, that needs new thinking true interdisciplinary whole systems thinking. But I would also, being a cheerful, optimistic Scotsman, okay, like to think about the positives uh, that we also have, is that I think a lot of the, the work that we're seeing come out of academia now 
unlike before, thinks about scalability and transferability. And what we've looked at for regional solutions in Scotland with multi-vector sustainable systems is actually given us a toolbox that can ready that transfer to other countries, other communities. So yes, time is uh, against us. It's, it's challenging, but I think we, to our um, benefit, when you yielded appropriately, we've actually got the enabling technologies we need to deliver this. So I think there is a need to be energized and, and focused about the size of the prize we can we can get to. I think I think the technology is there. We have the technology today that we need. We just need to agree upon the the strategy. So that's one of my statements there. We have the technology. So thank you, David. And I can see that Knut has got the hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, well, first first point is yes, I do I do agree. We have the technology. Um, my point is is here that my my reading is <clears throat> on the one hand we say we are we are probably we have got different circumstances in our um, in our daily lives due to uh, laws and this and that. But I I was really really caught by your statement, Steve Mark, when you said about uh, collaborative research programs. I can fully sign that. I have I have the same um, same impression here. You mentioned uh, hydrogen has become a thing. Um, Hundred percent d'accord. Um, then you said it is a, always a problem um, with there's so much to do, uh, and we don't have have the people to do it. Um, again, one hundred percent d'accord with you. Um, and. Uh, also, the, the statement on the under-resourced authorities, um, there is such a wave coming in um, and will come and will become stronger in the next years to come. So at the end of the day, we might uh, talk about different levels and, and we have got city and we have got region and so on. What I see is um, it is a, it is a one-to-one -one, um, in terms of the bigger circumstances and that calls for me for um, mutual cooperation for exchanging because at the end of the day we all try to do um, to do the same within our our limits that we have regionally but we should not um, waste the time in trying to to make a new um, to make a new thing twice you know we should then then go together and from there um cooperate that's why i um i got really stuck with your statement Stephen mark and again i'm absolutely with you um and we should probably and that is my last sentence on this there has been a lot of cooperation between etp and uh and the efzn if i look back to the former nc project the european north sea energy alliance um and then yeah um, i think Likewise, again, it was a bit a bit chaotic, but this probably is now a good point where we um, go and and reconnect each other and um, uh, and exchange. You know, because we don't have the time to 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 invent things twice. We should go straight away together. Question from uh, Lorna online. Um, a number of EU countries are investing in internationalization and some are even targeting the UK. Some are using EC recovery funds for this. What's the appetite for funding international collaboration in Germany at government level? So that's a question from... <laughs> well, it's a shame we don't have anybody from the government to answer that question there. <laughs> um, well, it's difficult to, to separate the UK and Scotland in this because, of course, um, when we when we left the EU, there was a whole tranche, and my 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 fellow academics will know a lot more about this than I do, of international funding which suddenly disappeared. Um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure if we know how that's going to re be replaced yet. Um, each each university, though, uh, let me be clear about this. Certainly within Scotland, has huge appetite to uh, engage internationally. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, we have huge numbers of international students, whether PhD students, masters or otherwise. And also we have more and more exchanges from a kind of research point of view. 
Um, so the appetite is certainly there. I think that it's just not quite sure what the budgets are like for to actually to be able to do that. Thank you. And I, I know we will have more time for more discussions after the next round of uh, contributions. So I, I think we can um, continue now. And uh, Knut, I have you back, please, introducing hydrogen. Okay, thank you. I think this time I'm much better prepared than last time because now I can share my, share my screen. Just a moment, please. Can you see my, my screen now? Is that, is it shared? Can you see and can you hear? Because I cannot hear, hear you anymore. But can you hear us now? So yes, we can see the slide and we can hear you, Knut. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, yeah, we have, um, as one part in our discussion so far, we have spoken about uh, hydrogen and I have just made a little um, introduction to the Energy Research Center of Lower Saxony, the EFZN. And um, now I would like to go a little bit deeper as we um, have within the EFZN, we have uh, set up or established, if you like, the EFZN Hydrogen Research Alliance, which was a classic bottom-up approach of a small group of researchers who took advantage of the EFZN as a central research networking and communication platform. This small group started um, first joint projects on hydrogen some six or seven years ago. Meanwhile, we have got around 20 research teams uh, from our federal state who are now actively involved. Within um, this group, we have started a joint strategy process. Uh, so the group has derived search fields for hydrogen innovations and then organized themselves thematically in corresponding competence net networks, the so-called focus groups of which, uh, or these focus groups um, I have um, put on this, on this slide, it's six in number. The first is production of hydrogen using water electrolysis, um, together with all the, um, all the different ways of uh, producing green hydrogen. So uh, AEL, AEM, SOEC, um, uh, you name it. That is focus group number one. Then in terms of hydrogen, we have another focus group that is the underground hydrogen storage and infrastructure. Um, which has got the main um, topics investigating salt caverns and uh, porous storage and, and pore storage, as well as other salt uh, structures and also depleted gas fields. Focus group, group three is the future hydrogen combustion concepts with direct energy use of hydrogen through combustion. Number four is conversion of hydrogen into energy carriers, in particular here, hydrogen to methane and hydrogen to synthetic liquid fuels. Whereas the fifth focus group is hydrogen applications in fuel cells, um, in which we build the bridge from material development to manufacturing technology towards system integration. And last but not least uh, is the focus group six, that is energy system analysis, Meanwhile, we sometimes think we should name it energy system synthesis with a special focus on hydrogen, where we look into, in particular, into sector coupling, the economic consideration based on it, as well as the investigations into the resulting environmental aspects. And one last word to um, what we have achieved so far. I've mentioned since uh, 2018, 
we have made a number, a large number of projects um, that were conceived and implemented within these six focus groups or competence networks. We have currently 50 uh, projects on hydrogen up and running. Um, and we had, um, what I find quite remarkable was a, a leverage effect that could be developed as we had a startup financing of 10 million euro deriving from the uh, state of Lower Saxony. Actually also, as far as I know, from some, um, from some Volkswagen funds. Um, and from there, as a leverage, the EFZN um, Hydrogen Research Alliance all in all has managed to receive more than 80 million euros direct project funding, um, of which are 70 million federal funds. So funds, funds from, from Berlin, which means above all Ministry of Science, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Ministry of Transport. Um, and that is just a very short um, overview on what is going on in terms of, in terms of hydrogen. And again, what is from my point um, missing here is we need much more international collaboration. And probably um, in our discussion later on, we can, um, we can talk about ways um, of, going, of going together. I see the point that it's um, as far as, uh, as I'm informed, it is still not, not clear uh, in, in how far um, uh, UK, uh, research providers, research institutions, but also industry is really funded by, by, uh, by Horizon Europe. But I have a few ideas, probably into mission innovation, where we um, should, um, should go and think about um, where are uh, other funds, if, if the funds that we normally uh, tackled um, are not really, really, um, uh, if you like, adequate or, or available. And with this, I would like to like to close and uh, go further to the to the discussion. Thank you. So we will definitely come back to some of your points. I'm sure we will just uh, continue with the uh, other speakers on this topic. Marcus, please. First of all. <clears throat> Sorry, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Markus Exenberger. I'm the executive director of the H2 Global Foundation. Uh, H2 Global is, is, is a very agnostic mechanism developed two years ago out of a how to say, real frustration about uh, these, these, let's say, very slow market ramp up and you know the, the, the time pressure we have to make sure that uh, uh, an existing and functioning market for green hydrogen and derivatives uh, uh, could be or should be developed. So I have now one question to you. I have prepared a five minute keynote speech if you agree, I can show you a presentation and I will do it without my prepared speech and uh, maybe it might be a little bit more lively. Is that okay for you if, you, if, if, if I show you a, a PowerPoint presentation? I'm sure that's perfectly fine. Yes, please. Okay, perfect. Then I will... I'm not very used to Zoom because we are always using... Um, we are always using um, MS Teams. But it's the green, uh, green arrow at the back. Okay. Can you see there is a green arrow for sharing screen? The screen is green. I, I can see it. So, um, just top one. Um, I'm really sorry. It doesn't work from a, from a Mac here. So then let me come back to 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 my prepared speech. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. But would you like me, would, would you like me to um, ask maybe David uh, to go first while you try to see if you can share later? Would that be right? Would would be really highly okay. appreciated from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then uh, David, I can ask you to go next. Okay. 
we have a slide which hopefully um, our friends can share. So I'm going to I'm going to so so I'm David Flynn, uh, professor of cyber physical systems here at Glasgow. But I, I wear other hats, so I should declare them. So I'm a Tubsud associate. I'm a Net Zero board advisor to Scottish Power and SP Energy Networks. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have had some good success with Siemens and Baker Hughes and Cell in terms of Scottish-German collaborations and, and hoping more for the future moving forward. So my slide, in the spirit of international collaboration, okay, um, thanks to the great efforts of colleagues at Newcastle, Cardiff and here at Glasgow, we actually have an open portal of information that you can all access um, this is actually showing you a distribution of the type and scale of hydrogen projects in the UK, but we've mapped this throughout Europe. And of course, part of understanding where we go next is having a situational assessment of where we are at. You'll also find on that portal there, and, and touching, touching on communities and looking to understand the importance of place, We'll, you'll actually find studies that we've done with National Energy Action, Community Energy Scotland and Wales to understand people's attitudes, awareness and acceptance requirements to future hydrogen services in their life. OK, so on the topic of hydrogen and to make you aware of, a, of an opportunity on the horizon, Glasgow, along with our partners there, will be leading the UK's national hydrogen hub, looking specifically at integration. So looking to a scalable and international hydrogen economy. And what's really advantageous about this forum is that for any hope of a hydrogen economy, I would, I would break it down. I would try and simplify things and say, you need the right signals, assurances, and supply chain confidence. Signals is policy. So it's excellent to have the Scottish Saxony dialogue here about commitments. Assurances is the reward mechanisms. Hydrogen really does require a circular economy business model, which I think is actually truly aligned to sustainability. Okay. If you look at today's energy markets, you typically have mechanisms such as all designed to protect customers, customer minutes lost, customer interruptions. You don't have the reward mechanisms for social inclusion, network reliability, decarbonisation. So, so we, we need to, what's great about hydrogen is that it makes you have uncomfortable conversations and forces people to consider doing things differently, okay? Um, supply chain confidence, touching on the points raised there uh, by, by, by Mark and others about how do you deliver this change? And again, this is where you require cooperation. If you look at the forward investments happening in today's UK energy market, there is a lot of healthy interaction between UK and German companies in delivering that energy transition. Now, in our hydrogen consultation, and this is where some of my, my optimism does indeed come from, is um, I believe we do have the technologies that we need to move forward at a national and international um, kind of uh, forum in Europe in this area. One of the reasons I would say that we were chosen to lead this is this objectivity we have to hydrogen, okay? Here at Glasgow, energy system integration expertise. So whether it's the spectrum of hydrogen, the means of integration, and distribution, so if that's new infrastructure, distributed storage, and also the end use markets. Is it transport? Is it heat decarbonization? We are neutral. So we bring that objective lens to assess what is the appropriate intervention at what level to that use case. Now, again, to, 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 to heap praise on our colleagues for um, organizing this today, what is, what binds us here is that there is no economy in the world that will decarbonize each of its individual critical sectors, be it economically infeasible and climate change intervention, okay? So you must do whole systems thinking. You must look at that aggregated value, okay? That's, that's, that's simply fact, okay? 
How do we do this? Interestingly, and it's, and I have to declare my bias, I'm a professor of cyber physical systems. So I'm going to sell to you that cyber physical systems are very important, okay? Because that's how you connect distributed and previously isolated demand, assets, networks, and services. So you can actually move at pace. You're not talking about necessarily always having to have new transmission infrastructure. Okay, we're talking about the connectivity and the technology rollout of data and digitalization. So as we look to the, the energy system of the future, it will be very multi-vector. Hydrogen will have a targeted part to play. And, and one of our keynote speakers um, in opening today's event spoke about trust. Trust will be key to that. Signals, assurances, supply chain confidence, that's an international affair. And that needs shared ambition, vision, and objectives. So in terms of what we can do for people today, and, and I'm aware you'll elbow me, Joya, if I go beyond five minutes, is we do have some elements of the toolbox, not all of it, but some of it, because we've, we've been very fortunate to lead large projects such as the Reflex project. So that was a 30 million pound community project in the Orkney Isles, looking at whole system energy transition. Okay, local generation, hydrogen integration, transport, non-residential, that will mirror many of the challenges in Saxony. And what we need to do is look at how best to fast track and tailor those solutions to our global community. Thank That's you, me. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Marcus, I don't know if you are... on and offer a contribution. Well done. This is the effect is I have. He doesn't need us. Maybe not. David, can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Perfect. Sorry, what did you say? <laughs> we only said all the bad things about hydrogen. Did you want me to start or? The sound is uh, coming and going, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's dropping in and out from me as well, David. Yeah. No, nope, can't hear. Now you're on. Yeah. Yes, apologies for the uh, um, sound issues. David, please, yes, if you wish to start, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Can you see that okay? Raise your hand, I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, right. Um, well, just let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, um, 
David Scrimger, um, greetings from uh, Munich. Um, I, I've been working on the subject of hydrogen for the last three years or so. Um, and the focus really is on seeing if we can actually get some projects uh, started because the demand is here, but the supply um, is, is not. Um, so, um, Scott Tajer uh, is a project that I was involved in initiating and coordinating. I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, you see the map on the left. That's basically the way that uh, hydrogen is going to get into Germany, uh, the imported hydrogen. Um, and you can see how far away that is from um, the south. So, um, as some of you may know, Germany uh, will be importing 70% of the hydrogen it needs. It doesn't have the uh, renewable energy capacity uh, to produce 100%. Um, there's a bit of a pushback at the moment in terms of more projects happening in Germany, uh, which is good. Um, uh, but nevertheless, even with all the potential uh, being utilized, it still won't be enough. And there are significant moves uh, by the German government uh, to uh, fund uh, and support uh, international cooperation on the export of, of green hydrogen. Um, Scotland, of course, as we know, has a huge onshore and offshore uh, wind potential um, with grid limitations uh, for electricity generation, um, reckoning on perhaps 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by the early 2030s and uh, perhaps 20 uh, gigawatts of onshore wind by the um, late 20s, maybe 27, 28, at least that's uh, the Scottish government's um, in, intention. Um, and the Scottish government has an excellent Hydrogen strategy, I think we all have to um, congratulate what the Scottish Government has been doing on hydrogen uh, in terms of policy over the last few years. Um, and the purpose of uh, supporting the export of, of hydrogen from Scotland, which may come to some people as surprising or maybe even you know, not a good idea, is that um, it's clear that supporting hydrogen exports will accelerate the transition to a, a Scottish hydrogen economy and will also reduce the cost of hydrogen produced. The fair transition concept of the Scottish Government uh, is an excellent idea and something that I uh, haven't seen really being replicated in any way uh, in Germany so far. Um, so that's something that the Scots can perhaps bring uh, to the table uh, in terms of the development of, of hydrogen economies. Um, these companies and various oil and gas companies are all planning um, in Scotland for the production of, of green and blue uh, hydrogen. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things about the Scottish proposition is the oil and gas industry. It's something that other uh, countries don't necessarily have. Um, it's a fantastic uh, amount of uh, skills, uh, technology, and experience of doing major uh, offshore projects will surely come in very useful for when it uh, comes to the offshore production and export by pipeline of uh, hydrogen. However, and this is really the point of uh, Scott Tajer, um, that will only start in the early 30s. Um, a huge amount of investment required. You're talking about the offshore production of, uh, of hydrogen. Nobody's doing that at the moment. So there's a technology challenge. Um, there's a financial uh, challenge. Uh, there's also um, the question of you know, the timing because it will have to be combined with uh, setting up the uh, pipeline network, uh, which is planned to link into the European hydrogen backbone, although that's not really um, already uh, agreed uh, from, the, um, from the EU side of things, uh, but presumably would make sense. So the Scottish Air concept is about starting production from 
you know, the significant resource that we have in Scotland of uh, from onshore wind and exporting uh, hydrogen to southern Germany within the next four years. Um, and you might ask why southern Germany? Well, again, just looking at the map, you can see how difficult and how long it's going to take uh, for Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria in the south of Germany to get uh, deliveries of, um, uh, of, of hydrogen. Not only do um, both those regions suffer a shortage of renewable energy capacity, um, but they are not expected to be part of the European hydrogen backbone before 2035. You're talking about, you know, 12 years from now, which is, you know, um, a catastrophe for, um, uh, for, for industry uh, here in the south of Germany. So we, um, I put together a proposal um, and we uh, got funding from Scottish Power and Scottish Government. The study um, start was launched at COP26 in, in Glasgow last year, and we delivered it uh, in, in June this year. And basically it was looking, um, as the title of the slide says, uh, building a green hydrogen supply chain from Scotland to Germany, um, with a view to having uh, customer relationships established as early as possible and also offshore agreements, which would be planned to increase gradually by volume to the point where offshore uh, production of hydrogen uh, is available. However, since the, the bulk of the study was done, the war in Ukraine has created an energy crisis uh, in Germany. So, for example, Bavaria has 90% of its gas supplies uh, from Russia which is way beyond the uh, average uh, in Germany, which is around 50, 55 uh, percent. So you can see, you know, for, for Bavaria, um, Baden-Württemberg is slightly better off, but not significantly. You can see um, the existential nature of the situation here in southern Germany, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, even some people here, I'm not really, certainly not the politicians have woken up to the, the severity of, of the situation down here. Um, the demand uh, is, is now, um, but there's no supply. It's a truly bizarre situation. Not only uh, do, does German industry have its net zero targets, uh, but it now has uh, the need to um, uh, supply its uh, manufacturing and processing uh, industries uh, down here in the south and you know with no prospect or at least no uh, finalized supply chain you know we're talking about uh, uh, a complete more or less almost an industrial revolution or certainly a hydrogen revolution with a plan of the German government to have the entire gas network uh, in Germany um, with uh, gas uh, with hydrogen um, running through it by 20 uh, 40. You could imagine, you know, the 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 technology shift that's required for uh, for that to happen, and for all the applications to adapt uh, to using hydrogen rather than uh, natural gas. Uh, so, uh, what's happening in, in Scotland, Bavaria? We've talked about uh, Lower Saxony. Uh, there was also a visit um, by the Bavarian government in June this year to Scotland, and an agreement was signed between Ivan McKee and the uh, Energy and Economics Minister Eivanger uh, here in Bavaria um, to uh, import hydrogen from Scotland to Bavaria and interestingly uh, to export technology for the production of hydrogen uh, to Scotland. So it's a real win-win if we can put this together because Scotland doesn't have the full supply chain for the production and transport uh, of, of hydrogen. Um, but there are many, many companies here in, in Bavaria in particular that do have that uh, technology. So you're looking at inward investment opportunities as well as an opportunity for the oil and gas industry to uh, transition to hydrogen from fossil fuels. And last point, um, the second uh, Scott to Jair study, which we're currently looking at uh, starting, uh, will be focused on green and green ammonia and green methanol, uh, specifically because um, those are the uh, derivatives um, that are um, being talked about um, more and more at the moment. And basically, it's because they can use existing infrastructure 
uh, for transporting them, which will, uh, as again, you look at the map on the left, uh, there's going to be, you know, the, the need for a solution, either probably by rail or by inland waterway down to Baden-Württemberg and, and, and Bavaria. And uh, yeah, there, the quote from Annalena Baerbock, everybody knows this, um, but it seems to be extremely difficult. Hydrogen has been said already is part of the solution, but a really important part of the solution for uh, Germany and for Bavaria. Thanks very much. I'm afraid I can't hear anything. Thank you. Thank you, David. Oh, that's and better. That's I'm now better. going yeah. to see yeah. if Marcus is back online and uh, if Marcus is ready to give his uh, five minute contribution, please. Are we? It looks like we don't have him back online. We don't have him back online. Okay. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll be able to join us while we study the conversation. So I'm I'm happy to kick off a bit of discussions here. Um, and I guess we can start from maybe the last topic, hydrogen. And I would like to ask Karen, Thomas and Jamie to each please comment on some aspects of this. For example, uh, we're all aware of uh, a recent study uh, that um, um, stated that hydrogen has a global warming potential, which is twice as high as initially estimated. And as we know from, from the gas industry, uh, our gas pipelines, our gas infrastructure, gas compressors can be quite leaky. And so we are potentially going to put out there in the atmosphere another um, uh, cause of global warming. And um, also, if we, if we think about the different types of hydrogen, and I, I know that only hydrogen, generally speaking, has been mentioned today, but I think in the first uh, speech by Christian Meyer, he was making clear reference to green hydrogen only. Um, so if, if, we, if we open up the debate also to blue hydrogen and knowing that at least in the, in the UK, for example, there is no proven injection of CO2 underground, there is no ongoing injection of CO2 in the UK CS, how do you see potential unintended consequences? And Karen, I'm, I'm stemming very much from your, your presentation also on unintended consequences, aspects of sustainability, and Jamie, what you said about the, the just transition and the inclusion of everyone. So I'm, I can invite each of you, Karen, first to perhaps comment. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, hydrogen is an area that we're researching. And, and for me, as a, a, an economist by training and, and my core research approach, you know, my first question is, you know, what do all these different colours of hydrogen mean? And I know, as I think you're probably talking about here, about the global warming potential, you know, that, that there's that there's a range of issues about how hydrogen is made. And but I'm always pursuing the economic implications. And I think in this context, you know, one one really interesting piece of information that we got from a colleague working at, at Grangemouth, where they're looking at at still buying gas, but then doing blue hydrogen production with carbon capture and, you know, and we, we'd we look before around things like carbon capture, but the capital efficiency implications, you know, you need more equipment to do the same thing. But, you know, one issue that, that he raised was that they would probably need to buy about 20 percent more gas to, to get, you know, for hydrogen to give them the same amount of industrial heat. And for me, you know, that that straight away, it suggests that there is an inefficiency, you know, because you're having to buy more gas and all right, you're, you're, you're aiming to capture the carbon, but I don't know how much of the emissions are caught. But I think I think that's the, the real issue that I'm trying to to get at is that you know hydrogen is in principle a low carbon fuel and it is in principle something that we want to switch towards. But but what does it actually mean? It's not as simple as introducing a new supply chain and a new type of energy. It's you know how is it used and how is it supplied? Do you know you know if if companies are investing in doing some kind of in house blue hydrogen production. Do they need a connection to a network in case they produce too much? How will they be able to switch if green hydrogen does come online at scale? And one of our projects, the project where we're looking at this is where there's, you know, linked to the marine leasing grounds that we've had. It won't just be electricity that's generated offshore. The offshore could give the capability for producing hydrogen. But then, you know, how can users switch? Is it the users who switch or is it going to come through some network and it'll be like, different electricity generation options. So I think that there's probably so many technical questions like the one about the global warming potential that, that you've mentioned, but 
I think we really need to get to the to the, the you know kind of the, the real nuts and bolts about what this means in economic terms, and you know, and, and it's it's the cost to the firm and what that might do to their competitiveness. Because you could get a a swing. We've talked a lot in Scotland about how things like carbon capture and storage, hydrogen production could allow a transition pathway for oil and gas workers. But if we end up doing something that has such cost implications that firms lose competitiveness, you could lose jobs. You know, if we end up offshoring activity, you know, the, the activities that would use the hydrogen, if things get too expensive and they move production overseas, well, then you might gain jobs in a hydrogen supply chain, but lose jobs at, at the point of use. So I think, at, and then that, and, you know, I was a member of the Scottish Just Transition Commission, and, you know, and it's one question that we kept on asking is what are all the things that we need to look at? And one thing that we were very keen not to repeat is there have been a number of transitions in the past in Scotland that have not been just. So we we had a big drop in Scottish emissions when we stopped steel production, but we didn't stop using steel. We just offshored our emissions to somewhere else, but we had a devastating impact on, on some communities where a lot of people's jobs had depended on it. So I think that that's what why I'm really pleased to be getting into the area of looking at hydrogen research, but it's not just the economics of a new fuel vector or a new supply chain. We, we really need to understand what all the implications are so that we can start to, you know, as you said, you know, one of our specialist areas, because we look economy wide, what might be some of the unanticipated impacts if you don't do things right? And you need to understand them because if you understand where the unanticipated impacts that you don't want might come from, then policy can intervene to affect that. If, if, if the overall outcome of using hydrogen is a good one, you want policy to be able to step in and make corrections where you might be getting some things that you don't want. So it's it's a really complex picture that I don't think economists and people doing work that I, like what I do, trying to understand the wider economy picture, we really need to get into this area now so that we can understand what some of these consequences might be and how they might be affected. From you. Yeah, um, yeah, hydrogen is called the champagne of energy transition. So hydrogen is the super power. Hmm. However, uh, it is not the solution. It may be, and it will be, it must be part of a solution. Um, and uh, from a legal perspective, in Germany, for instance, uh, our energy law uh, was amended with uh, regard to hydrogen, it was uh, yeah, hydrogen is now an integral part of energy law. Um, for instance, regarding the transport of hydrogen, the pipelines and, and all that. Uh, however, uh, what you said, of course, uh, that hydrogen may be also, yeah, maybe another uh, climate killer. Uh, this is, of course, not a legal question. That's a question I cannot answer from a legal point of view. However, uh, the law has to find answers if this is the case. And uh, so what we need are environmental impact assessments here. We have an environment, environmental in, impact assessment act and so on, uh, which with regard to installations, we have uh, to the plants, we have uh, 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 strategic environmental impact uh, assessment um, with regard to plans and programs and so on. And I think these instruments must be applied here to see whether, yeah, to yeah, uh, evaluate whether hydrogen is uh, sustainable or not. And I mean, we, we've uh, just heard the discussion in, in under European law about taxonomy. Uh, and in European law now, uh, uh, nuclear energy and gas uh, for investment purposes is uh, supposed to be sustainable, which is of course a joke. And and we should not run. Uh, uh, we should not trap and yeah, put our foot in the same trap here uh, with hydrogen. So the law has to give the framework, but. The actual decisions must be, and the evaluation must be by made by uh, natural science and by, of course, by by politics. The law is only uh, gives us 
the frame, but we cannot make the decisions. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, so as, as a climate scientist who has been shifting in my career from looking at only the causes and consequences of climate change to moving into the solutions space, and I, I've been doing that over several years now, um, there's no smoking gun, there's no easy solution. It really does concern me when you hear that, you know, hydrogen perhaps has this global warming power that we previously weren't aware of, and we might be releasing more of this into the atmosphere, because although there's an urgency to act, we can't act in a way that's going to cause more harm to the planet and more harm to people. A lot of the solutions that we've been looking at are local, are regional scale solutions. They're circular solutions. Some of the work that we've been doing with the council, for example, is looking at ways for citywide energy solutions. Um, and it's not just about the technology, it's about the partnership models that get put in place. It's about how those partnership models aren't only about profit, but are also about how do we make concessions for domestic energy and heat use. It's about, um, there, there's so much more to solutions than just the technology side. And I think there's a real need to carefully consider any of the sort of solutions going forward. And when we hear kind of, you know, red flags about certain solutions, and we need to make sure we're doing our, our due diligence in terms of what, what the consequences are, because we need urgent action and we need urgent action that's not going to enhance the problem. Thank you. And may I now also engage the audience presence here today um, in this room and also the audience online. We've got uh, the remaining 20 minutes for this session, which I would like to see uh, becoming more interactive at large. So if there are any questions to the panelists who have spoken today or also any additional comments or experiences you would like to make or share, please raise the hand, the real hand if you're in the room or the virtual hand and chat. So you can you can post the, you can post your questions in the chat if you're online. The Q and A session, please. Yes, please. Hi there. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm Danny Terrell for the UK Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, or Indrik, as we like to say, because to say that quite easily. Um, my questions to all the German colleagues in the room and online. Uh, skills uh, across the UK, we work with the seven community industrial clusters, all of them say we do not have enough engineering skills. And it's why, in a sense, we're actually a plug, we're releasing a skills report tomorrow, saying we're going to need 350,000 new skilled engineers across the whole area there, and we've always got issues with Brexit, et cetera, bringing people in. Is that an issue in Germany? Where are you with skilled engineers for your green transition, so on and so forth, like that? Um, what challenges do you see in terms of rescaling the workforce or diversifying away from other industries? So, question for the German colleagues. It doesn't have to be the, uh, the speakers, it can also be German colleagues here in the room if you wish to offer suggestions. Knut, you got the hand up, please. Yeah, I can. <clears throat> I can at least make a start. Um, I. It was very, very difficult to to get the um, to get the question acoustically, but I I understood um, how's the situation on the skilled workforce on hydrogen in Germany, more or less. No. Um, actually, difficult, and what we see is a big lack of. Um, of professional career profiles that we have um, not fully brought into uh, university education, but also into craftsman education. And I see, um, I see a kind of uh, flashback to the times when the first wind energy plants were, were installed. There normally, at least in Germany, um, there was no, um, no professional skill like a, a wind energy installator or a wind energy plant installator. So at the end of the day, there were um, plumbers and there were uh, car fixers who did a redirection of their job and they are now working for many of these wind energy plants. Um, and 
we 20 years later, probably 30 years later, we somehow jump into the same trap as we now have got a new profile that is the hydrogen um, installator in a way um, with so many different um, so many different um, qualifications that you need. You have to know something about compression. Uh, you have to know about the pipes and 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 um, and to answer your your question in in one sentence, we have just started to realize that we do not have the the right skill workforce. Um, and our our reaction is that we now start with um, with these courses both on um, on, the, um, on the on the academic level uh, and this also also includes on the CEO or CTO level but at the same time also for um, for craftsmen's courses um, because um, on the one hand um, business leaders have to have to know something new and that is hydrogen beside the hype and it's it's the it's the one one solution for everything hype that we have been going through and this is now changing as well um, up to the um, up to the um, person who is doing hands on the job and who is really um, doing the job out there at the pipes um, it has been long long time it has not been realized and now it is it is starting to go next to go next David, I can see that your hand ah, is up. Okay, I, I, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you again. Um, yes, I'd say two things, um, both uh, on the positive side for Germany. Um, one is that the energy generation distribution uh, structure here is very different from the UK in that you have well over 100 um, Stadtwerke, you know, publicly owned usually, uh, providing services uh, of power, gas, uh, mobility, uh, waste, water um, to population. So, for example, here in, in Munich, um, the Stadtwerk München, I believe, is the biggest Stadtwerk in, in Germany. It's something like 8 billion turnover business uh, with huge capabilities uh, in terms of uh, delivery and technology and research and, and so forth. So uh, you do have uh, in basically every major city, town in, in Germany, uh, these organizations that are um, structurally shifting to uh, this new situation. And so you've got that um, support mechanism, you know, where, uh, where the hydrogen is going to be uh, applied. Um, and and, and the, se the second thing um, is, is that actually in terms of the research side of things, I mean, I haven't been involved in hydrogen research, but that's what we've been talking about a lot today. Uh, there's been a huge amount of research being done over decades into hydrogen and different aspects of it here uh, in Germany, um, much, much more so, I believe, than anywhere else on the planet. Uh, so you have fantastic capabilities in terms of, uh, you know, people who have studied different topics and, and focused on hydrogen uh, also as doctorates and, and then in their work for organizations like the Fraunhofer. Um, so um, I think it's a question of how do you put all that together. Certainly, there is generally a shortage of, uh, of engineers uh, in Germany. Uh, skilled workforce is, you know, a declining population. It's a, it's a real issue here. But you do have that basic uh, background of, of research capability and uh, uh, the structure of the energy uh, industry in, in Germany. Thank you, David. Uh, there was one question from you. Uh, Gary Clark, let's call it uh, agent, the architects uh, uh, of science and technology. Um, we're also architects for the Bank Research Centre for Glasgow University, and we've got the new building, which is the multi-use building, which is 25,000 square building. Now, um, I think the question I'm going to ask, I'm going to lead up to it, is really is, uh, I've kind of dipped into this, and it's all about hydrogen. Uh, the context in terms of uh, how much hydrogen should, you know, do we need? And then what is the best use of hydrogen? 
uh, hasn't really been discussed. So when I pick you back to the context, is actually you know, there's that you know terms of construction sector. We are now going for all electric buildings. Okay, so that's our, our, our final goal. Uh, hydrogen has got a place to play in terms of we've got fantastic, um, you know, or University of Glasgow, fantastic just your heating system, partly on gas. So again, that, that, that's going to be an easy sort of change over. So really, it's a question really coming down to, um, you know, how much, um, first of all, is what's embodied carbon hydrogen in terms of generation? And obviously, the global, the global impact of that. Uh, and then really, what's its use? Now, I'm just going to give you an example. So in terms of our new building that we're designing, it's a 25,000 meter square building, and I chaired the uh, the RBS scale the futures group for many years. So we've written all the uh, guidance for construction industry, which has been adopted by many of the professional bodies. What we're trying to target is a 75 percent reduction of energy demand. So again, the big point here is actually we're talking about generation. So we've got to talk about demand reduction as well. 75 percent reduction in energy use per you know, per year. But also a 50 percent reduction in body carbon of how we actually build our buildings. So apply that target to our new building for Glasgow, and I still get about 7,150 tonnes of CO2 mm -hmm. as the in terms of the current thing. So um, how do we then uh, use that in terms of the offsetting? How do we sort of bridge that gap? How can climate and help? Uh, but really, what it comes down to is that over that period, it's going to get like between two and one and a half to two million pounds. For Glasgow to achieve net zero. So, what, how, how do we use that money wisely? And that could be sort of part of that, that hydrogen situation. Mm. So, that's kind of the big context. The other side is um, we're actually working with that global mutual, which uh, this is kind of ground up. They've actually got four black, um, green hydrogen uh, projects on the go just now in Scotland. Uh, they're going to try and aim for 100 megawatts of gas per day. That's their kind of goal. They're doing that with no initiatives from the Scottish government or various other governments. But then they're really cottoned on in terms of this uh, economic uh, driver. You know, you know. So, anyway, so that gives you the sure. context, really, you know, um, you know, back to that question what's embodied carbon or hydrogen generation? Yeah. What's, what's its real role in going forward in terms of decarbonize? For me, it's the construction industry uh, issue as well. That's the panel here. Thank you. Anyone wishes to? I can Mark, start. Yeah, you start, okay, and, I'll and then you can up. think about that, yeah. right? Um, the driver here isn't the demand. Uh, the driver for the Scottish government is they're going to have all this wind. What are they going to do with it? Uh, and the answer is, we don't want to curtail it. What we do, we'll convert it to hydrogen. Uh, what are we going to do with the hydrogen? So I think that's the discussion the Scottish government are having. It's not they see the demand for hydrogen, therefore they can see how they can actually fulfil the demand. They have all this wind, uh, which we're not going to be able to use all the electricity from. So what are they going to do with that? Mm -hmm. So that's my view. <clears throat> so to, to give it some maybe numbers, so Scottish Gas Networks, they forecasted about five gigawatts of hydrogen for heat decarbonisation by 2025. Mm -hmm and about um, 35 gigawatts of hydrogen by 2045. Um, they see the world is predominantly blue and green in the Scottish context, and they think that by adjusting the gas safety management regs, you can get about 20% hydrogen through the existing gas networks. Okay, so that's their view of the, the low-hanging fruit. Uh, now, in terms of built environment decarbonisation, it's a very interesting challenge. The UK government just released that report that said it was going to be a 25 billion investment to decarbonize the UK's public buildings. Okay, huge number. And it is very much, in terms of the building per se, it's very specific to its type uh, the, the, and its location. You know, when we look at new builds, we're probably more primed for intervention with a combination of, you know, intelligent energy demand management, heat pumps, you know, intelligent kind of passive materials. Um, hydrogen, I think hydrogen's part to play in the UK and even in the Saxony context will be on kind of non-residential demand. And in buildings, that's a difficult one to answer, but you're, the, the lens, I would say, you're putting to it, you're looking at the, the real life cycle analysis of the carbon, okay? And that's interesting, okay? And I like that because that's scrutiny. And I would say hydrogen does need that scrutiny in terms of how it's generated, transmitted, 
distributed and used. But we don't apply that same fairness to all of the other green technologies that we've backed. Because if you've done the carbon accountancy on, say, wind farms, a five-year warranty on a wind farm that has a 25, 30-year design life, landfill of composite blades, um, the ethical issues, are, I mean, batteries. So electrification, okay. Firstly, rare earth elements and a lot of second life difficult questions to answer about that pathway. But also, I think where hydrogen perhaps eases some of the transition is you cannot afford to purely electrify the decarbonisation pathway if it's heat pumps or EVs. Okay, the, the network would require so much investment to support that it, it would cripple the economy. Okay, um, to your point about the catch the embodied carbon in hydrogen again. You do have waste of hydrogen, you've got nuclear, pink hydrogen, blue, green. So again, I think you have to look at that specific spectrum. And um, the most efficient options tend to be whenever you can achieve that local generation and demand closely coupling it together. So um, I, could, I think if you wanted real hard metrics, I would, of course, point you to that amazing website I shared with you today <laughs> and read the wonderful works, okay? Thanks, David, and also for bringing up this connection to uh, a fair comparison of all the yes, energy yes. solutions. And it's interesting what you're bringing up in terms of also your point of acquisition of the mm. of the energy vector coming into the building. So how far back upstream do you need to go into the calculation and disclosure of the emissions? Because then mm. if, even if you were, for example, hydrogen, there would be a different uh, embodied uh, carbon footprint mm. depending on which hydrogen it is. But once it comes into the pipe, do we actually have any traceability of the true origin mm. of the hydrogen? Or is it just going to be transported around as hydrogen full stop? Yeah, I think so. If I come back to it, I think that the, the point in terms of we need to sort of do the body power and the impact mm. of mm. the it's going to be a level playing field, and then we then see yeah. what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Um, then picking up the point of, um, I suppose it's the uh, the, the generation, or so the distribution. It's, it's a mix of something. Uh, yeah. We're totally, totally get, get that. Uh, I think that our company that we're working with are looking to big industry, mm. trains, you know, ships, things like that, mm. to then sort of then focus on that, and then and the energy plants as well. And that's what we're doing. A uh, quick one is just testing a thing here. I've looked back at some of the. Uh, the old uh, Victoria coal gas network, and mm. that, that one was sixty percent hydrogen. The issue yeah. was it was forty percent CO two, which then obviously had a, a dampening effect on. I mean, it was is that, is that right? That's the yeah, yeah. Hi hydrogen's been with us for a long, long time, and part of that traditional in the UK context Victorian kind of infrastructure that we've we've, we've had. Um, it's 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 interesting that. Um, as I say, I think what where hydrogen found itself being displaced in the decades that kind of followed is the is purely down to the economics, purely down to the economics. Um, so now, as we move forward, to my point raised earlier, a scalable hydrogen economy actually needs a circular economy, which captures your very important interests about decarbonisation and the value of these assets throughout their operational and you know end of life. So yeah, your your initial start there was right. Yes. Yeah. Well, it seems to be that Marcus, Marcus Exenberger has some technical problems. Yes. But let me just um, explain to you why he is so important for this conference here, because uh, Marcus Exenberger is CEO of H2 Global, and this is a foundation based on, uh, on, on a consortium of German industry. Mm. And they run a limited, and the limited has been tasked to buy hydrogen everywhere in the world. And uh, it's a kind of very interesting subsidized mechanism. So the federal government sponsors this limited company in the first year with 800 million. And, uh, um, and it's, it's a plan, uh, plan to expand this in the next years. The idea is to sell the hydrogen um, cheaper to German industry now. So yeah. uh, we will see whether this works or not. But that, that is 
Max Exberger is the German hydrogen buyer in the next years to say like mm. that. And therefore, it is very important for all forms of uh, um, um, discussions about uh, partnership. And uh, that's it's a pity that this internet uh, broke down a couple of minutes ago, which also says everything about the German infrastructure at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we will bring in his expertise, of course, and he's a very good partner in Germany to discuss all our questions here because he's really responsible for the federal strategy. And uh, the foundation had its seat in Hamburg. Uh, and so the plan is really just to work together with Scotland and some other countries. And it's a direct partner, and we will uh, maybe he's able to fix it, uh, maybe not. We will see. Otherwise, we of course will complete as we'll come back to you with Marcus and the foundation because, uh, from my point of view, it's the biggest actor in the whole field. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I'm aware there are also a couple of questions in the chat box, and we need to wrap up because officially we were supposed to uh, conclude this session now, but mm -hmm. we can probably run over five more minutes. Uh, David. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah just to say a, something. Yeah, just a quick point on H two Global. I actually, have organised uh, a call uh, on Friday this week, uh, together with Wood PLC, who worked on the Scott to Jer study, um, including Marcus. So uh, the question, the fundamental question, actually for me is, and it's maybe somebody's already answered, is um, this uh, mechanism, which has just been boosted to four billion uh, from from nine hundred million. So it's significant in every sense. Uh, as as was just described, um, it's for non-EU countries, Mark Stevens. So there may actually be a benefit from Brexit after all. <laughs> so the question to clarify, as far as I'm aware, is because it was originally intended for countries like Africa, faraway places, you know, as part of the um, German government's international development uh, strategy. Um, uh, but you know, obviously, uh, on paper, UK, Scotland. Uh, should be eligible, um, and we'll clarify that on on Friday, hopefully, um, finally, um, and uh, I'll let I'll let people know what the answer is. We made earlier about the EU taxonomy, mm. and the EU taxonomy has, of course, just been updated with uh, interesting inclusions and interesting exclusions. Mm. And also carrying on again with uh, some favorites who are exempt from having to present an LC analysis, a life cycle impact analysis. And so I think it would be crucial to keep on pushing for more transparency in the taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about the post Brexit, we, 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 we are in the process in the UK of developing our own UK green taxonomy now, which of course has now been delayed and delayed and delayed further because of the. Um, dynamics that we've seen at the top. But there are potential opportunities for shaping or reshaping what is really meant by green from the point of view of investment, but with a more transparent LCA approach in, in view. Um, so very briefly, I can see online a couple of questions which I'm trying to uh, convey to all of you. One question for Thomas regarding the role of the, I think it's the IEA, International Agency for Energy, I believe it is, in facilitating energy transition, do you think energy law can reshape the relationships between different actors? Mm -hmm. um, so would you see the law then the law in energy as being the catalyst that could actually bring different actors, maybe even different countries more together? Well, that's a good question, of course. Um, I mean, looking at the yeah, energy law, uh, it, the EU has a competency uh, the, for legislation according to Article 194 of the uh, Treaty of the Functioning of the EU. And uh, I think uh, uh, the major initiatives are, are coming and should come from the EU. And uh, not only we should not only look at, uh, let's say, at Germany and so on, but it's much more important that we have an EU-wide uh, yeah, kind of yeah, unilateral um, yeah, legal framework, uh, um, and uh, and then I think the law is a possible uh, driver. The law can change, can uh, initiate uh, uh, changes uh, in, and for instance, by giving incentives and so on. For looking at hydrogen, uh, for instance. Uh, 
I mean, we have the relative, I think, I think very successful Renewable Energies Act in Germany, which is also kind of based on EU law uh, with uh, the feed-in tariffs. And maybe we need a similar instrument for hydrogen uh, to give uh, incentives to invest and so on. And I think so the law can be, uh, can be very important in changing uh, the situation here. Uh, but as I said, law is only what we say, uh, it's only politics in another, in another, in other words. It's a law, is, uh, it needs, of course, the yeah, democratic institutions, the parliament, and so on. And it needs the, the support of the whole society to do that. And it's not uh, just not so simple that we make a law and then everything is getting better. Um, that's not, not that simple, I would say. But, uh, but yes, I, yes uh, we can. As I said, we can uh, give incentives that, that we should do. Thank you. And there is one second question from Sarah Online uh, for David. Um, uh, for the strategy transition to hydrogen, does Germany, is Germany taking into account, uh, I think it's about exports? from different countries or imports, oh, imports from different countries for energy security reasons. Yes, it's definitely imports. Yeah, that's so I think that's this is for David Skimjo. I think David is when you were talking about also the dependency of Germany on the Russian gas earlier on, you had the map on the screen. So yeah. would this be effectively the driver to uh, discuss more large possible imports from Adjacent yeah, I mean, the, there was already a, a, a plan with two billion of funding from the German government to import uh, basically green hydrogen from all over the world. And there are now been agreements signed with, with Saudi Arabia, with Oman, with Chile, with Canada, with Australia, you know, uh, to supply uh, hydrogen. Um, and uh, the war in Ukraine it's interesting what's happened since then is that there's been a greater focus on energy security. So more a focus, which might benefit Scotland again, um, on European, um, you know, in, independence of, of supplies from, from outside, from places like Saudi Arabia and so forth. Um, and the great thing about hydrogen, of course, is you just need to have wind um, and sun and preferably both um, to, to produce it so you're not you we're not um in in hock to you know a few countries that have the have the resources like with fossil fuels um but i just want to that was a good question because i, I wanted just to one final point for me uh, to underline here you know um there's a lot of talk about you know which is the right which is the right derivative you know um how how do we agree on on you know the the issue of um emissions from different forms um, the issue here in Germany, in my view, is existential, and uh, we need to get on with supplying Germany, Lower Saxony in this case, um, with with green hydrogen. And these issues will be resolved. You know, we're talking about a situation where we're existing on, on fossil fuels. Um, the, the fundamental point for Scotland, though, is um, will we be cost competitive uh, for the hydrogen we produce offshore in the 2030s? with the other countries around the world and in Europe, for instance, Denmark is going to start supplying Germany with hydrogen by pipeline by 2025. And they have huge plans for building energy islands in the North Sea and so forth. So there's a real risk in my view that um, not only will there be a, a problem oil and gas transitioning just from a, a technical and, and jobs point of view, but there's really a question mark about whether we can produce in Scotland uh, green hydrogen that's going to be uh, cheap enough. The energy security uh, uh, issue helps, but it, you know there are other parts of Europe that are busy, like Norway, uh, putting together um, uh, hydrogen exports. To an end, and I would like to uh, thank all our panelists both in person and online, including Marcus, whom unfortunately we have lost along the way. Uh, but thank you, Jörg, for bringing his voice around the table today. Nevertheless, 
So I found the discussions really, really interesting, extremely proactive, and obviously leading for many, many options for collaborations between Scotland and Lower Saxony. And may I now invite to the podium Professor James Conroy uh, for the closing remarks. Uh, James is the Academic Director of ICAS and Professor of Religious, Religious and Philosophical Education here at the University of Glasgow. The debate about what we're going to give up in order for what we are going to secure has never been more prescient, never more urgent. And so I think that as we start this journey, and we certainly in ACAS want to ensure that we can support this conversation beyond this and look to, to, to our foundations and our sponsors to, to help us to develop um, uh, an, an infrastructure, an ecology that brings together all of these questions is hugely important, whether it's the legal questions, the rights questions, the technological questions, they're all part of what we want to support going forward. Now we have these plans and we hope that you will be part of those plans as we go forward and think about how do we cash some of these things out in projects that are going to be transformative. So at this stage, well, and we're going to get into this in the next in the next session, get into some of the detail about how we might think about some projects. Um, but at this stage, it remains on, on behalf of your and myself and the ACAS team. Just thank you all, thank you all quickly for, for, for all her work in facilitating this and connecting everybody. Thank you all very much. With the urging words and for mentioning solutions, which Jamie also mentioned earlier, so connecting the challenges to the solutions, even though if it, even though if it means sometimes to reassess them on an annual basis along the path, but uh, the two have to come together. So um, we can therefore bring this session to a close today. I would like to thank everyone who joined us online, both the panelists and also the audience online. And thank you also for asking questions in the chat. Um, we will now take a coffee break for about 30 minutes. And for those of you on site, we will reconvene at 4 p.m. Uh, in small uh, discussions groups around the tables that you see here. And during the coffee break, can you please think about some ideas stemming from the discussions we've had today uh, about what we could do moving forward, what we could do together, and why the coming together could be strengthening the, the approach to identifying solutions. So while you enjoy the coffee and the, homo and the tea, I'm also giving you some homework. And then mm -hmm. we'll come back here, please. So once again, thank you to everyone who participated in this session. Thank you.